Awesome. Good morning, everyone. My name is Dale Lutz. I'm one of the two co-founders of Safe Software, which means I've been around for a long, long time, almost uh, closing in on 25 years. And I'm joined this morning with my good friend. Uh, hi, I'm Iris. Um, I'm currently a web developer on our uh, FME server team, uh, leading a little GUI team there. Um, but I've done a number of different roles at Safe. You might recognize me for a couple years ago. I, I was on our um, what was then the pro services team, and I have done webinars. It's been a while, um, but I've also worked on a few different areas of the product and development. Um, and I think that actually several of the problems you're going to show today um, go, let you revisit some of your old work. Yes, yes, they do. A few, a few, probably a few little examples here and there of things I've worked on. So uh, that'll be interesting. To see. Anyway, it's <laughs> great to have you back on. And joining us all the way from stormy Manitoba is Mark Ireland. Good morning, Mark. Good morning. Uh, yeah, I'm the FME evangelist and uh, responsible for much of the training that we do at SAFE. So thanks for everyone for tuning in today to this webinar. It's a bit of an experiment for us. We hadn't done this kind of thing before. And when this webinar was envisioned, we thought we would just go through a few of our favorite transformers, a little bit like, you know, maybe I would sing some Julie Andrews, a few of our favorite things. Yeah. And, um, and we would go through, in fact, Iris had already mocked up a few of her favorite transformers. I had too many favorites, so that didn't work. We couldn't just go through because there were just too many. Yes, so instead we threw it out to uh, to all of you and said, hey, do you have any interesting challenges you'd like to solve? And uh, and we got, I think, a total of 13 or so really interesting yeah. inputs. And then uh, we just couldn't say no to any of them. And so we decided to take on a bunch of these challenges. So what we're gonna do is go through a bunch of different scenarios. Some are easy, some are hard, some are in fact impossible. Yep. And yeah. uh, and we will uh, we will we'll kind of admit defeat on at least one or two of them um, uh, before yes. the day is over. But at least throughout that, we'll try to highlight at least our problem solving approach and a few of the interesting uh, techniques and transformers to get out of different scrapes here and there. Yes, and we'll also try to highlight some alternatives because FME is a very flexible tool. So this might not, the examples we show might not always be the one true way, um, but we'll try to give you an idea how you can approach different types of problems. Yes. So hopefully this will be helpful for everyone out there looking to learn a little bit more. So there we all are, we yeah. already introduced ourselves. Yeah. And uh, Iris, was, that was one big ant. Yes, that was a big ant. Um, it was in Mexico City in I think the National Botanical Garden. Wow. Uh, yep. So I had to take a picture with the uh, giant ant. And I think, there. I don't actually have any idea where that picture of me is from. <laughs> um, during my Indiana Jones phase, perhaps, one of the FME World Tours where yeah. we had that as a theme. And Mark, did you say that was just a few months ago in Manitoba? Um, not quite. I was a little bit younger, but though. Say 1960-something, yeah. maybe. So there, there actually was snow in, uh, in Great Britain. It was. It was in Derby, if anyone's interested. Okay. So, okay. so um, we're also joined next door by a bunch of folks that are uh, ready to answer your questions. So Debbie, Nathan, Trent, and Stephanie are standing by and ready to answer questions, as is Mark as well. So do type in uh, to the panel and um, and get, keep them uh, keep them gainfully employed next oh, door. Yeah. Yep. Yes. So yeah, lots and lots of stuff we could get into. We're gonna try to fit this into an hour. We may uh, have kind of an overtime for people that wanna hang around and uh, get dig in deeper. Iris and I haven't spent a lot of time rehearsing. No, we haven't. <laughs> so we won't be stiff and over rehearsed. We can promise you that. Yeah, that's right, this is a little, it's almost like improv, FME improv that we're doing here today. Yeah. So, um, so it should be, should be fun, should be exciting. A few things that we really wanted to highlight, though, before we we uh, dig into things, and of course, there's there's I guess three websites here that we we want you to be aware of or, or pages. First is the the transformer gallery itself, safe.com/transformer. Should I try clicking on that, Iris? I think you know what. Let's give it a try. Oh. Ooh, Maybe I, not. Oh, oh, there we go. We have so, so this is, if you go to safe.com slash transformers, this is all the transformers, and you can sort them by most used to least used. And um, and then on each one of them, you can click and find out a little bit of their story. And then kind of like Amazon, people who use this transformer also used uh, these other ones. 
so that's that's our way of kind of navigating the whole thing. And so Tester is the number one. Yep, Tester is always a fan favorite. It's always very handy. So I will uh, tell folks in FME 20, can't, I can't stop talking about stuff like this. In FME 2019, we're overhauling the interface of the tester to make it a little less clickalicious. Oh, So yeah. um, there's a lot of clicking in the tester and there's number one, and so we're really looking at that. But I always like to go all the way down to the bottom to see what is the, the, the least, least popular. Ooh. And look at this. What oh, is the virus? It's gonna be the, it's gonna be the uh, poor, is it the pin? Oh, it's the Pinterest connector. Number 500, I, I didn't actually know that. We have exactly 500 transformers, we have according five, to this. Oh, and even 500. And uh, so if you uh, <laughs> care about Pinterest, um, it's lonely, so lonely. It's lonely down there at the bottom. And so that, that's one of the things we wanted to share with you. Um, there's also the transformer booklet. Now, if you come to FME World Tour events, you can get hard copies of this, but otherwise the PDF is here and you can um, flip through this. It makes for great mm -hmm. late, late night reading. Um, once you get into it, it's all the transformers in there with little happy pictures it's of what they pictures. do and, yeah. and so on. So that's another one of them. And then I really wanted to highlight this tutorial here on, uh, on doing dynamic, here it comes merging and joining transformers, how to choose the right one. So that's, that is one that is um, uh, definitely worth looking at. Yeah, this is one of the most common problems. A lot of times we're bringing data together. Yeah. So this is a really great overview of different ways you can do that. Yeah. So those three we'll uh, let you take a look at. And whoops, what has happened here? Okay, I'm going to get back to presenting mode. Right. So. If you're new to FME, the best place to start, of course, is the free training that uh, we give online. Hey, Mark, are you uh, you're you often the instructor? Is there any of those coming up? Uh, there are a couple coming up, and in fact, there is one on upgrading to FME 2018, which is uh, sometime in June. So um, that's right. So safe dot safe dot com slash, slash training slash training. Okay. Yep. Right. Now. Uh, we also this morning posted a, at least one of the um, examples uh, up on the Knowledge Center to see if anybody would bite and give us an answer. And uh, Mark, should we take a peek at that right now? Are we asking for trouble? You could, but it's quite empty right now. So if right. anybody would like to uh, chime in, please do. Uh, so yeah, if you look, um, actually I'll go to the front page of the questions and answers. So if I go to the Q&A forum, Mark posted that one an hour ago, and this gives you an idea how much activity is on here. Let's see, Mark's is at the bottom of the first page wow. already. So um, lots of stuff going on there, and actually following along in this Q&A form is really a great way to learn FME. Oh yeah. Because you see all kinds of interesting problems being solved and uh, and talked about. So that's we, could, we, that's we could do an entire webinar of problems that people post on there. There's there's some very interesting ones. Yeah. So the ones that we put up there have to do with, uh, I, I called it movie magic, but it's not really about movies. It's about scraping web pages and uh, using probably what HTML extractor or HTTP caller. Yep. And yeah. then picking through that to figure out uh, what kind of links there are. And then now that you've got links going out to an FTP site, pulling things, we know that that's a very specific type of scenario, but if anybody wants to put up an example of scraping a page to get links, that would be the kind of thing that could be helpful there. And then the other one is an XML example, which uh, there's a, there's at least a, a small cult of people that yeah. love FME XML. Yeah. yeah. And so maybe they'll pick that up. But with that, let's jump into the first one. And Iris, you did some work on this. So do you want to talk us through what this example is and then we'll, uh, yeah, sure. what does it even do or what's it, what, what problem are we trying to solve here? So this is a problem that uh, one of, uh, we tweeted out a request for scenarios. This is one of the ones that came in. I think it was the first one that came in. Um, and this uh, user was asking about, they'd like to be able to analyze raster images um, using historical radar data from NOAA, which is the U.S. Uh, National Ocean, Oceanic and uh, Atmospheric Administration. And uh, what they want to do is take these freely available rasters and they wanted to compare um, these radar images. I'm assuming they're of precipitation. That's the thing we typically use radar for when you see the Doppler on the news. Um, these kind of images 
with a linear feature of an electric line and they wanted uh -huh. to see how often does the radar or the precipitation or clouds inter intersect with the electric line. So okay. this is actually a fairly involved scenario here. There's a lot of different parts to it. First, we have to figure out our intersections and then we have to figure out through a series of images how often these things are, these things are happening. But uh, to break it down, the uh, main thing, I think Dale is going to open up. Oh, here. Or we could go to the next slide. Sorry, yes. I'm looking. <laughs> right. So, uh, so here we have a few different different key transformers here, highlighting a few. Uh, the main thing is we want to calculate an intersection between, in one case, a vector feature, which is our electric line, and a raster, which is our mm -hmm. radar. Mm -hmm. So we have two things in two different formats. Um, the first thing we got to think is we got to get them in the same format so we can intersect them. Now, my initial thought, I'll admit, was to just go into vector because it's really, you know, easy to think, okay, when does this line intersect this polygon? So what you would have done there is turn the raster radars into a whole bunch of little squares, I guess, in vector land. Yes, so you can do that. There is a transformer for that. I believe it's the raster to polygon coercer. Yes. However, I was talking with Dimitri here, um, and Dimitri is an expert at safe and rasters, and his recommendation is always to stay, he's done a lot of performance testing with rasters, and he says always stay in the raster as long as possible because things will be much faster in the raster land compared to vector. Because the data volume gets so large, if you're blowing um, pixels into polygons, you are making a lot of data, yeah. and that just takes a computer longer. So, so somehow try to solve the problem in raster land. Yep, so with that handy tip from Dimitri, I instead went the other way, and I want to turn my line into a raster, and for that I'm going to use a numeric rasterizer, so that's kind of uh, the star of the show in this workspace. Um, so, and then, yeah, let's just open it up right now. So let's see. I, I previously had opened it up. So should I just run it while we, we're talking and you can walk through things? Yeah, let's just run it. So I'm starting with, um, I've got a whole directory. Maybe you can open up, show that directory there and show so what our source data looks like. If I click like. here. Uh, maybe there. open it in Finder. There, okay. And then we'll just look at one of these images. If you just click on one of those pings here. Um, these Ooh. are these are what our data looks like, and we've got this whole series. I think there's 33 of them there of different radar images. That's kind of like what you'd see on the news when they go through, you know, the precipitation. Um, now this looks really pretty. We know red is probably higher higher precipitation. Um, however, it's not as useful when we're actually doing analysis. We want to see with analysis, we really just want to deal with flat number values. So um, initially in this workspace, I'm doing a few things to just kind of get that raster uh, into shape so that we can work with it. So the first thing I do is I really want to clarify my no data, mm -hmm. no data band. And this is really key when you're working with rasters. Um, there's different way, different formats, different rasters represent basically empty values. So some use something like not a number. Yeah. Um, there's, diff there's different things there and it's important for consistency. I like to just work with zero because you yeah. can multiply things by zero. The famous minus nine, nine, nine for map input yeah. paper, that was a no data. Yeah. But, so you, you decide to just tell I this like raster zero. zero. I like zero because you can multiply by zero, add by zero. It makes it really great for doing analysis. There's a lot of fun tricks you can, can use when things are zero. Um, and the other thing I need to do is, is in order to make that raster look pretty, there's that palette set, so it's red, green, and blue, but that's not really helping us do our analysis. In fact, it's interfering, so I'm just going to take that palette right off because I don't need it to do my analysis. I really just want to figure out how often, we're really just crunching for a number here, how often does that radar intersect this line? Okay. So I don't really care about the palette get for the purposes. The just get rid of it. Okay, now you're sorting. So I'm sorting because I want to make sure I hit these images in order. So I have this yes. whole directory of images. And uh, just to be safe, they have numeric, uh, numeric component in there. So I'm just going to sort them to make sure I read them in an order. Right, and just so folks know, the base name is the... Part of the file name that isn't the extension and in rasters that's very important so it would be this http download blah, 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 blah. Yes. and these numbers came from the website of their original data yes and okay. they correspond to uh the the actual they're in order corresponding okay. to the to the and these are actually five minute five minute intervals and i'll just mention for rasters the base name is automatically exposed but in general you can always go to the feature type properties and find that under the format attributes here if you ever need it so, but it's always there for rasters. It's always there. Ready to go. 
All right, so now you're counting. So I'm counting and I use the counter. This is a really handy one anytime you're working with multiple features just to get a count attribute. Is this the first feature, the 10th feature? Yes. Um, I'm gonna use this a few times throughout my examples. Ah. So that, that just makes it easier for me. In this case, I wanna line up, I wanna know which raster it is because uh, the transformer that's actually doing all the crunching, the raster expression evaluator um, needs even pairs of, of numbers. So I'm gonna be grouping by that, that count yes, number. Yes, because I see what you're doing here. You are making two copies now of the raster. One of them you're setting into the expression evaluator as A, that's your original. Yeah. The second copy goes down here, and what is it doing? So now I'm gonna take that second one, and I'm really just using, I don't care about the raster on the second path, I'm just using that to trigger for each raster, I wanna read in the power line um, to, to get an equivalent pairing of a power line with it. So I've just created um, this uh, a power line in in a, in a JSON file. This is just a simple line that intersects with my raster for uh, for purposes here. And I'm you know uh, in reality you'd probably have this in a CAD file or something a little more interesting. Well, I, I think that there's a popular guy on on or, or woman on um, Twitter the at shape file oh, that would yeah. say that 80% of the time it's likely to be a shape file in here. But in any case, what you're going to do is reread this file over and over again because it's always the same line. Yeah. And then it's just one line that's going to come out of here. It's going to be one line coming out. Um, the key here is using the 3D forcer. Ah. I want to make sure, because when we turn vectors into a raster, mm -hmm. the value of the, the cell value actually comes from the elevation. Uh -huh. So in this case, it's not really an elevation, but I just want to set my elevation to one because, again, you multiply things by one. Um, it's very handy. So I want all the places there is no power line. All those cells will be zero. All the cells where there is a power line will be one. Mm -hmm because the, the the numeric rasterizer is what's going to turn that yes. vector line into a raster and i see here background value of zero so that that's all the places that isn't the line so that's a sent effectively doing the same thing i did in the other no data setter all in one in this transformer a few things i had to figure out i had to inspect my initial rasters i had to make sure to set my uh, number of cells and rows yeah um so i did those to, to match ma to match up evenly with the other one um and then the last thing i had to do is set, specify my extents um, and if you don't know what the extents of your rasters are, just open up, open them up in Data Inspector. If you click on the Feature Information window, you'll be able to find all this information. Um, and then you can make sure your vector, the raster you create from your vector feature exactly lines up with the one you have from your input rasters. So I'm clicking the little inspector icon there. So that's my source data here. Yep. So that would be... Um, that might load up all 33, so it might be a little slow. <laughs> it might be a bit slow. It might be a little slow. I might be asking for trouble. But uh, there they are. There we go. And so you're saying just drag a box. Drag a box. You actually want to select the whole raster, not not just yeah. the cell. And there we see your 2600 business. Yeah. So we can tell um, the extents and the number yeah. of cells and make yeah. sure we line up because that's so always... this. So these rasters actually didn't know their ground coordinates. They didn't. Okay. So there yeah. were files. I just didn't bother. I just right. took a quick shortcut there. But if you're working um, with with real data, you'd probably want to make sure. Yeah, um, you'd have your, the your, real your, coordinates. Yes, okay. there were files. I was just a little bit lazy and I didn't. So now, do that. now you got a pair. You got your original and you got um, something that is either zeros or ones. I yes. actually should mention uh, you also turned off anti-aliasing because that stops you from getting. Yeah. And fives and funny things yeah, like that. Yeah, anti-aliasing more makes things look good, but for yeah. analysis, you don't really want anti-aliasing. Uh, anti-aliasing is again more just make things look pretty, make your lines look pretty. Um, but we don't we don't care about things looking pretty for this. So uh, the real heart of this thing is the calculating the intersection, and uh, we're just doing this with the raster expression evaluator. Um, I'm going to show this transformer again. It essentially allows us to just perform any kind of math between either one raster and multiple bands of itself yep. or two rasters. So in this case, I've got two different rasters. I've got my raster of my radar data and the raster of the power line. And all I'm going to do is just multiply them. And this is effectively going to give me an intersection because in any yep. spot where um, my electric line is zero, the output raster will be zero. So yep. I'll only pick up features where there's both non-zero radar values and electric line. Yes. So only those cells will come through. And if there's never any intersection, I'll just get a raster full of zeros. Um, so that's really where that where everything's happening. Ah. Now, um, now what I want to do, this is actually a problem. It's not just a one raster problem. This is a time series problem. I want to analyze over multiple rasters, right? So um, each feature coming out will be its own raster with its own in calculated, uh, inter its own kind of intersection raster. So I want to find out what are the min and max of this raster? So if the line didn't intersect at all, it'll be zero. It'll just be zero. 
Right. Um, so the, the min and max will be zero. If yes. it does intersect, um, I'll find out what the maximum, the highest value of intersection is. Yes. Because if we look at the, the use case here, they right. actually wanted to find over a threshold. So, so the, it's not just any intersection, it's an intersection over a threshold. And so here you're saying if the max is greater than lucky 13, I, I picked 13 just kind of looking at this data. I'm sure someone who actually works with this yeah. would know, have a more meaningful number, um, but that's that's kind of what I just came came up with for now. It gave me an interesting result. So any radar value above 13, I believe um, it's out of uh, 255 there. Yeah. So um, now, ah. so now I'm gonna just check. Um, do I have is my min and max over the threshold? Um, so the tester would have done that. The tester yeah, is pretty, set. The pretty tester, simple. The tester did that. Just check Checked if it's more than 13. Now you picked only six of the 33 rasters ended up coming out of that. Yes. So those are all rasters where I had a positive intersection of the yeah. threshold. So these are the ones I care about. These are the ones where I kind of had a had a, in, an intersection occurring or a, a hit occurring. So um, what I have to do now is I also want to throw out, if two in a row, if it's the same cloud intersecting in two images, and it's just the cloud moving over. I don't want to count those as two distinct um, hits. hits because I really, I think the question is how often do they come over? And I'm just going to count those as the same same overlap. So I want to throw out scenarios where um, it's just the same, essentially same cloud. And the way I'm going to do this is by looking ahead. So I know everything, every feature that I'm coming in here is going to be an intersection. So I'm going to look at the count of the last feature to come through here, which may have been many features ago. Yes. So I'm going to get the number of the last hit. Um, and that's important um, because then I'm going to take that number and see how long, hey, what's my number? What yeah. was the number of the last hit? That's the number it's been. And these are five minute intervals. Got so I'm going to multiply by five and that'll give me my interval in minutes since the last intersection with the cloud. So this is using this mode in the attribute creator where you can look oh, back or yeah. forward. <laughs> yes. I think you, you and we were involved in the team that did that work a few years ago. I, I was involved. It wasn't me. Yes. I think that might've been a little before my time. Okay. But um, yes, yeah, so this is, this is the, really the heart of this problem. So uh, this might be something that's easy to ignore. Um, attribute creator is one of the most commonly used transformers. You may have never expanded that advanced value handling. Yeah. Um, but this really is very powerful feature. It allows you to look ahead and behind um, from each feature. So we see I'm going feature minus one count. That's saying, tell me the count of the feature before. Yeah. So, and, and also to optimize it a little tip, you see I've only set, I've set it to one and zero. Um, the reason for this is for performance, you really only want, if you're only looking one ahead, set it to one. Yeah. Um, don't read in, because essentially everything ahead, we have to store it in memory. Um, behind yeah. the scenes. So if I put in 50 there, I'd just be storing 50 things I didn't More need. More bookkeeping. Yeah, so we just want to, you know, it, it can be handy. If you know you're only looking one ahead or two ahead, just put that number in there. So at the end of this, you know, for this feature now, I know how many minutes it, it's been since the last time it touched a cloud or the yes. my line touched a cloud. So now I know that. Yeah. And then I'm just going to use another tester to throw out those adjacent ones. So if the interval is less than five, it means it was just the same cloud from Got last it. time. So I'm just going to throw those points out because those, I'm not going to count those as separate. And then finally, um, uh, wrapping things up in order to calculate um, you know, something meaningful from uh, this, I'm going to figure out the average interval. Um, it wasn't actually specified in the question, but I'm assuming the you know a common thing you'd want is the average interval between uh, intersections. Um, so the statistics calculator allows you to calculate a lot of different types of statistics. The the basic ones, min, max, median, um, even things like standard deviation, uh, mode. But in this case, I'm just going to pick a few of them that I care about. Notice I've actually, uh, if you open it up there, I've actually cleared out the statistics calculator. Yeah. Actually, comes pre-populated. Another quick performance tip or just kind of yeah. cleanliness tip is to delete the ones you don't care about. You'll get less attributes on your features. There's less in memory um, and everything's just kind of cleaner. So I like yeah. to delete the ones I don't care about. So I'm just going to get my min, max and mean. And then if we, uh, because we're really just at the end of this, we're just getting one number, yes. a, a few numbers. So I didn't really bother to write out to anything. Um, I'm just kind of doing this to, to do a calculation. So I'm just going to log it out and see the values of those attributes. And we'll see my, our mean is 67.5. So roughly just a little over an hour, we're having a- Every hour. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're getting, getting an intersection. We're getting rain. So it is must this, be- is, a, is this in Vancouver somewhere? It, it must be somewhere quite <laughs> rainy. Maybe it's Seattle. I, this is- uh, Somewhere so. in Great Britain, Mark? Oh, he's tuned us out. Very okay. likely, yes. Yeah. Fonzie okay, probably. so that's- uh, one of the more complicated yes. ones. I just took the hard ones here, <laughs> and uh, a lot of stuff going on there. Um, 
if you uh, you'll get the recording afterwards, you can play it back in slow motion. But again, the key thing: turn it into a raster problem, yes. and then start working in raster land, and then the adjacent features trick to uh, do the math to figure out how long between interesting events. Yes, those are some hopefully handy yeah. tips to uh, there we go. use there. Yeah. Okay, so now um, let's see. So we've got a customer here for scenario two that has an interesting database. And I might try to, uh, I'll, I'll see if I can pull this off. Uh, this is again, kind of like improv. I'm gonna open the mm -hmm. data set in a new view. Um, I'm gonna do MS Microsoft, um, let's see, what do I want? SQL Server Spatial. I'm gonna go through the JDBC side since I'm on a Mac. You could use another thing on a, uh, like uh, you can use the ADO if you're on Windows or JDBC, yeah. either one. And what I want to just go here is show that there's a bunch of table, there's one table and a bunch of views, and I think it's inside of DBO, and there's stuff in here. Whoa, there's lots of stuff in our development one, but if I go down here, there's some about wind, wind, wind turbine layout. Yeah. This is the master table, and then there's a bunch of views in here for the different versions. So in the master table, they put like a revision number or something. And so there's view zero through N, and then there's a VC that is, represents the current state of the mm -hmm. wind turbine universe. So I've got a bunch of these. They all, of course, their views are the same original table, so they all have the same schema. And what we want to do is dump it out for our at shapefile friend. We want to make shape files of these versions. Okay. Um, and we want to uh, not have to change the workspace if V7 shows up or V8 or V9 or V10. So we need this thing to be dynamic. And, and so to pull that off, um, it's not, it's actually remarkably simple uh, how to do this inside of, of FME. And I want to thank our, actually I didn't mention them at the beginning, but Paul Nailis from the database team helped me to, uh, to get this going. So if I go over to my finder and I, let's see, I got to hop up here to the dynamic one and if I look at the, the, the workspace to read the data, here we go. So this is the entire workspace to pull off this customer's requirement. So again, they want to not have to change this workspace whenever new revisions happen. They want the current version to go to one directory of uh, a shapefile mm -hmm. and then the, the historical ones to go to a different directory. And mm -hmm. so how did this workspace get made? The key thing was we generated the workspace originally by adding a reader for one table, and then we went into the properties and we said merge the feature type, and then we used a merge filter to say match any tables that look like this. These happen to be views, uh -huh. but that's gonna give me the V1 through 2 million and the VC. And so when I do that, all of those, all the data from those tables is gonna come through here. And they all have the same schema, so we don't have a dynamic schema going on, we've got the identical, um, structure and so now what I'm going to do is just test does the FME feature type okay and I should show that we also in this thing in the format attributes ex exposed the, the true table name yeah the true table name and so then in the tester I'm saying does the true table name end with underscore VC if it ends with VC then that is the current version and we're going to go to one shape writer where we can control what directory that's going to go to. And then we're, if it doesn't, we're going to go to a different shape writer that's going to go to a different directory. And then in the shape writer, I'm saying fan out, use as the output file name, the value of FME feature type. And so that's going to give me a shape file named after the table the data came with. And so I'm going to run this. It's always exciting to connect to databases that are far away and I don't know where. And um, oh, Ooh, it finished already. Yeah. And so it turns out there was two features in the current version and 14 in old versions. And um, I can see down here a nice little table that tells me that it wrote a V0 to 6 and a VC. So 16 of them written. And with any luck, actually, I can hit this button here and we can look at the output uh, folder and look at it. It just did it right now. Um, so that's really happy to know. And in the history folder, is um, all of those historical versions. So, no, now the, a new version comes, yeah. I don't have to change a thing, it all works. So what's the key uh, finding here? 
it's the merge feature types to match dynamically data mm -hmm. that uh, that's going to maybe change. The, the feature types are not hard coded in here. And then there's a simple test and then a writer to two different folders where we're again fanning out dynamically by the names. And again, the schemas are not changing. So ahead of time, um, it's possible to, uh, to, to know the user attributes ahead of time. So, and I think this one really highlights, um, it's not always what transformer do I use? Sometimes you yes. should be doing more work. Um, there's a lot of features in the readers and writers. So sometimes you don't need hardly any transformers at yes. all to solve a problem. It was a, it's a dynamic. And uh, actually, I'll ask the uh, experts in the background to, uh, there's, a, there's a tutorial that Brian and the team over there worked on, on doing dynamic workspaces. And uh, if this is interesting to you, um, I recommend highly looking at that tutorial. Actually, the next scenario is very much like the previous one. Ah. So this is a wild one. And um, let's go look at it. So I'll get rid of this. The idea here is that we're going to get a bunch of different CSVs. So anonymous automation. I got a bunch of different CSVs that they're going to come to me with the same name always. So it's some sort of a mobile app that has a bunch of forms in it. And when it um, when they when they get the data sent in, it's always called temp.csv, and it'll have a bunch of different columns or fields in there, um, but each one is different. So if there's there's the temp, here's another one, here's another one, here's another one, and so the first thing I noticed was that the only way to tell really what CSV you have is that very leftmost column. If you notice mm. that thing, is discharge culvert blah blah blah. That's a clue. If, if I have that value or that column there, if it exists, then I know what other fields I want. And so what did I do to, to win at this one? So what I did was if I go into here and let's grab, no, I mean the wrong one. I'm in anonymous this time. Anonymous, read many CSVs. And I go over here, look at this. No, I don't want to save that. And, um, I generated, I went readers, add reader, and I, I went CSV, let's do CSV, and I said, I had a sample from our friend of all of these, um, and I said, okay, let's generate from all of these, but let's use a single merged feature type. Ah. So that's going to go whoop and basically say, look, I'm going to give you the union of all possible fields. And so when I click this open, I see like a big, long, ugly, use, useless um, thing that's got everything possible in it. Now, one thing I noticed was that all of them have a field called lat underscore long, which is the point. So ahead of doing any magic, I'm going to actually make the point. So I first split the lat long by a comma, and then I make a vertex out of it. And... Um, and then I set the coordinate system so that we know that it's lat long. So that's that's kind of getting ready for all of them. I did notice that lots of them, the lat long is blank. Ooh. And so that will Ooh. be rejected when I go to this vertex counter. So I'm saying, look, I don't care if it succeeds or fails uh, because we're going to get the data anyway. Mm -hmm. And I'll, now, if, if uh, the customer cared, they could throw out the data that didn't have a lat long here. But I'll just collapse that. And then the trick was, how do I pick these apart? And I use a test filter here to say, look, if, if the culvert GPS point, that special one, is not missing, this is how I can say, does is it there? It's, it's sort of the opposite. Um, <laughs> so if it's not missing, yeah. then I know that it's a culvert. And, and you do this basically for all 11. I've only done three of them, but that's how you can figure it out. And then what I did was, if I know it's a culvert, now I can go in here and uh, just keep only the attributes that are related to culvert from that point on. And then I have a much, now I've got stuff split out. And from here on, I could do whatever I wanted to do with culverts mm -hmm. and I can do whatever I want to do with discharge from here and so on. So that would be the technique. So again, mm -hmm. merge them all, figure out who I've got, keep the things I want. If I run this, um, I'm going to get a whole bunch of data that uh, comes rolling by and um, yeah. So I think there's actually a way, I think you're not missing trick. I believe there's also a has value operator. 
So that might be a nice, yes. nice way that's a little bit clean. A little, right. A little, yeah. Yes, it should. Uh, they both do the same thing. That's right, in those in those predicates. There might be other other ways. I think I know, because I think that was one of the. <laughs> the one that you did, I, I think. I think I added that in it one Yes, time. so that was that one. And again, I tested by, again, as Ira says, phrasing the test carefully. Yeah. And then filtering them to split out, because it's a weird case where the input is coming, but we don't know what structure it's going to be until we start testing, and then we can impose structure ourselves. PDFs. Uh, Iris, you want to talk us through what this thing is trying to do, and then um, we will uh, we'll go and uh, I'll maybe get it running while okay. you're describing. Okay, yeah, maybe give this one a run because it's a little bit, actually, a little bit slow. Um, so this was an objective. Uh, essentially, how do you produce a PDF kind of booklet um, of, of pages? So we kind of want to produce a map book. So the scenario this customer uh, had, was they want, um, you know, they have a number of images of, say, different, uh, I interpret it as different buildings or different maps. Um, they want to show an image of a map, maybe a few vector maps, um, a title, um, some descriptive info about the maps all on one page of a PDF. And they essentially want to do a, a booklet for each a booklet of different pages like this. So I kind of used some of our sample data that uh, Mark Ireland compiled from the City of Vancouver's Open Data Portal. So I'm taking libraries from the City of Vancouver. Um, and so I've got a few different data sources here. I've got points with all these attribute data about the libraries. I've also got um, CAD building footprints of the libraries, which I can use to show as a map. I can show the actual outline of the library. And then finally, I've got um, ortho photos for the whole City of Vancouver. And uh, the way these are cataloged is there's a number of different photos. There is actually a, a shape file of footprints. So I'm going to use the, the shape file of footprints to figure out which photos I need to read in. And then I can then I can add those photos to my map. So I can create a map book on these with a page for each library. So um, if we start up at the top, there's a bit going in here. So uh, starting out with the library points, um, this is kind of the source of my data. I'm starting with just the libraries. Eight of them. There's eight of them. So, um, and again, I'm just going to stick the counter again is very handy because I'm actually going to use the counter, um, a trick for the PDF writer. If you want to write multiple pages on a PDF, the trick is to provide a PDF page number attribute. Uh -huh. And that's how the writer knows what page to put your features on. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to just take the count of my library because that's um, that I can easily map up to my PDF page number. So that's what that counter is doing. That's why it's right up at the top and it's just going to get merged through on everything. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is take those CAD building footprints and associate those with my points so that I can combine that attribute data. Um, and I'm going to do that with a transformer called the spatial filter. So there's a number of different ways we can um, calculate intersections and things like that um, associating two features. I want the filter because I actually have footprints for all the buildings in the city of Vancouver, but I only care about the libraries. So in a way, I just want to filter out uh, buildings that intersect with one of my library points. And that's going to give me my library polygons with all the attributes from my from my points. Um, secondly, I'm going to take the output of that. Um, and again, that'll have all the attributes merged together. Um, and then I'm going to calculate intersect those building polygons with the actual raster, raster oh. ortho foot footprint. And that I'm going to use to figure out uh, using the spatial relator, because here I want um, all of my buildings output. So the spatial relator doesn't filter like the filter does, but in this case, I want all my libraries. Um, fortunately, my data is good and they all intersect. Um, so now I want to calculate which orthophoto footprint is my building within. And uh, I'm going to do that. Um, then once I figured that out, um, there's an attribute on the orthophoto footprint shape file that I can use to figure out the name of my file. And I'm going to assemble my path. Um, there it is. Because I know I have a directory of all these photos, and I'm going to use that attribute to assemble my, then I know my file name, so I know what orthophoto to read in. And then I just want to clean it up a little bit, because the orthophoto isn't going to be nicely centered on my building, my library. Uh, so in order to do that, what I'm going to do is, oh, oh, feature reader is to actually read in my orthophoto. Yeah. Um, then I'm going to do a, a few little tricks here. I'm going to take the center point of my, of my library and just kind of buffer it. Um, do a square buffer. I'm yeah. setting my buffer edges to square. So basically, I get a nice little block around my library. And then I'm going to use a clipper to clip my photo to that nice little block around my library. So that'll give me a nice photo centered on my library. And, and I think, yeah. I think then let's, let's take a peek. So yeah. theoretically, we wrote out our libraries. So um, here they are. 
then actually the the workhorse of this is oh, the yeah. PDF page format. I should probably go into that. So we probably want to show this. So this is inside this custom transformer. We all come in here, and here's the. <clears throat> Oh, okay, and you laid out where the various pieces are going to be. So what this transformer <coughs> allows allows you to do is to put um, position things on your page. You can dynamically move around those um, those various things, and it'll center the various features that are sent into each port. So every port becomes a rectangle on the page, right. and you can everything that's sent in that port will be centered on that that part of the page. So I'm using that to kind of lay out everything together and combine it up all nicely. And then I'm, I'm sending out to the PDF writer using that page number attribute um, to create this map book. So um, this just gives you a rough idea. You could spend longer tweaking everything yeah. and um, really <clears throat> cleaning up your images. But roughly, this shows you the, the basic workflow of how to create something like a map book like this. Um, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> really, really cool. So yeah, <clears throat> again, you're relating things and then, oh, you also suggested this would be fun to output to HTML. Yeah, right? that's another thing to consider. Um, this is a, you know, you have a bunch more different features in that one. You have dynamic web content, dynamic charts. Um, you can also do maps with background map tiles. So um, I'd always recommend taking a look at that if, if HTML could meet your needs. I know PDF is popular because it's easy to send around yeah. and share, uh, but something else to keep in mind uh, if you're making reports. Okay. So there it was. <clears throat> I think we'll skip looking into the Knowledge Center because yeah. we're, we're going fast. Oh, oh. Over. The Iris's next one was the Winds of Change. The Winds of Change. This one is fortunately quite a bit shorter. <laughs> this is my shortest example, okay. so I can probably speed through this one. So let me just clean up. Talk, talk to us about so, what this one's so doing. So this one, this customer had a net CDF data. Um, again, I'm guessing this is also from NOAA. Um, with uh, bands, multiple different bands, one for the magnitude of winds, and I think this is across the world, magnitude of wind, and another uh, raster, another band of the raster for the direction of the wind. So it's kind of, if you think about this, this is kind of a polar to Cartesian coordinates scenario, if you remember any of your high school math. Um, so they want to go from this magnitude and direction to uh, two rasters with the magnitude in the x direction and magnitude in the y direction. Um, and there's a basic formula for this. You're multiplying the magnitude um, times the, the cosine of, of the angle converted to radians. Um, and the other one, you're taking the sine for, for the other direction. So uh, we're just going to do this in that raster expression evaluator. So here, it allows you to take two different bands of the same raster um, and, and do uh, some mathematical operations. As we can see, there's a whole list of mathematical operations yeah. available. Um, it's the same expression evaluator you get in your attribute creator. And you can do all this on your raster. Um, and then in this scenario, they actually wanted to take the raster values and go to points, yes. or actually put this in a table in a database. So we're actually going to blow out every um, every cell of the raster to its own point or its own row in a table. Um, and a handy thing there is to use the attribute keeper, like Dale mentioned. Uh, I think he mentioned it earlier. Mm -hmm. This will keep our output. Actually, when you go from raster to, to points, you're creating a lot of data. It's using mm -hmm. a lot of memory. It's always nice to clean up before that. Any attributes you don't care about or don't need, get rid of them, um, and you'll and you'll save a lot of memory, and things will always run smoother. So always recommend doing that. Uh, then we're coercing, we're turning raster into individual points. I think that's what we saw in the data inspector. We've got a lot of points now. Then we want to go one step further and take those points and just turn them into attributes. And right. the transformer <laughs> for that is the coordinate. I believe it's a coordinate value extractor. Is that it? Coordinate extractor. Coordinate extractor. Um, so that'll just get uh, everything into attribute values. And right. then you could write this out to whatever uh, database or And I think along the way, you must have exposed the band zero value. Like you, you would have done this and said, ah, yes, oh, let me did. see, because, <clears throat> because the raster cell coercer gives you a list of values. Yeah. But if you want to get at individual ones, you've got to get them exposed. So you'd have gone right click and said expose, yes. and you'd have said two. Uh, elements and then um, you'd have seen what you wanted there. Yep, so that's that's exactly how I did that. And then here we go. So uh, let's turn this off and let's see. This one are the points. That's our points, which don't look all that interesting. Um, here they are down yeah. in our nice table. This is this is actually what they want to write out this to the database. This, this is what we thought that the customer would want yeah. here. Um, because it's more fun. That's the that's what the wind uh, the wind magnitude looked like in the x direction. It looks like I wouldn't want to be like flying. Wind. Yeah. I wouldn't want to fly through there. I don't. Mark Ireland, would you fly through there in an airplane? Probably not. I go through in a train, but um, <laughs> yes. not a... in a train he might, but not in a plane. 
Okay, so that's the key thing there. And again, expression evaluating and then blowing it out into um, into points. Into points. That's about as simple as that gets. All right, Las Vegas. So I got 4,000 last files and I want to make DEMs and hillshades. So that was kind of a fun one. Um, again, using kind of dynamic workflows because I'm going to have 4,000 of these things. So where's Las Vegas? Here we go. Mass Las. And um, now, once again, when, when I generate this thing, you, um, what you do is you say, uh, I just want all, I, when I went readers, I said add reader, and I said I'm going to do last files, and I went and picked from the directory wherever these things live. Okay, so here we go, uh, inputs. I would have picked one of them, and then I'd have just gone and said, look, I don't care. I want all of them, mm -hmm. and do it as a single merged feature type. So that's so now, however many are going to be in that directory, that's what we're going to read. And so that's how we set this up. And I'm going to just run this while we're um, while we're talking. But so each one comes through, and then this is a trick Dimitri again rec recommended: is the last data often has way more in it than you want because we're going to make rasters ahead of making these rasters. Let's effectively resample the the last to be have much less data uh -huh. by, by numerically rasterizing it. So I said, okay, look, I'm only going to want 10 by 10 spacing ultimately. So I'm going to just thin this thing down to 10 by 10, and then I'll use that to do the hill shading and the DEM. Hmm. And you can play with this. Maybe I should have done seven by seven here, so I have a little bit more than I need for my final one. But it's a way of getting rid of a lot of data, so I make a much smaller um, result at the end. And so, um, so then I end up uh, producing what I wanted. Oh, and on the writing side, I added a GeoTIFF writer and I said, fan out by the original base name. The last file would have had some kind of a name. When I come out of this, I want to write out each raster using that same name. So the hill shades go to one folder and the other guys go to another. So if I go here, I can see here are all the hill shades and they're all named by the original folder that they came from. And uh, in the other one are the, these are not the Democrats. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> these are the DEMs. And so um, I can't, these are uh, floating point. And so the built-in Mac viewer doesn't get that sort of thing. Uh. So if I, whoops, I shouldn't have done it in that. Let me just say this. I'll open the data set. And um, yeah, that's, that looks good. So here it is. And that is the actual elevation model um, that was produced for that particular spot. And if I, um, yeah, I think that's that's great. If I look at the whole thing, did, I think it might have output it for me. No. Yeah. Anyway, so that's uh, that's what I got. So again, what are the tricks? Thinning it ahead of time with numeric rasterizer, dynamic on the input, dynamic settings on the output. These mosaicers were just if I wanted to see the whole thing uh, together for some reason at the very very yeah. end. Yeah. And so um, that's so, so Dave. Yeah, but, Yes. I would have thought, I was wondering, would it be better to use a uh, workspace runner in that case and, and run each one of those as a separate process? Sometimes that is a, a good trick. And what you could do, um, actually, in that case, I would set up a path reader and then have a, a slave workspace that takes the path of an input and does this stuff only one at a time. And yeah. you could do that. If you, uh, first of all, you can get some parallelism by doing that. If I was in an FME server situation, I'd do an FME server job submitter for the middle part. And that way I could have like however many engines, 16 of these going at once to get done in a bigger hurry. So, so it's a very good point, Mark, to kind of turn this into a master slave situation. If I only am on a desktop and I'm kind of doing stuff one at a time anyway, in this case, I don't really lose by doing it in one because each of these transformers works one raster at a time. I'm not really piling data up. Um, it kind of all flows through anyway. But okay. your point is a, a good insight. If I was going to get this done in a bigger hurry, I'd be wise to um, to to do this with a server job submitter or yeah. workspace runner and turn on some parallelism. Okay. Okay. I won't talk any more about that. Path production. Um, I don't know if Olivia is is waiting in the wings, but um, this is a 
not a very interesting workspace. If Olivia wants to come in here, she can talk to it. The customer has, uh, let me get the data here. Here's Olivia. She's coming. Yep. So I'll get the data queued up, Olivia. Uh, Olivia is a developer that worked together with uh, Heidi on uh, this project to beef up uh, the famous centerline replacer. And so while I queue up the data, do you want to tell us what you've been up to, Olivia, uh, in that area for FME 2019? Uh, hi, everybody. So um, we've been working on a new option for the centerline replacer to produce approximate center lines. Um, and the goal here is really to produce something much, much quicker than you would traditionally. Um, but at the same time, all of these are kind of approximations. So you get what you, you pay for. You get what you get. Yeah. <laughs> so this is uh, data that Olivia actually produced. And so this one here is the original data, I think. Yeah. So if I look at that just very quickly, um, this comes from the city of Red Deer and it's what, a map of a bunch of trails? I think so, yeah. And what's the issue? Uh, so the oh. customer wanted uh, center lines. I think all of the feature types are. There we go. Yeah. So uh, this, okay. So basically the customer wanted to replace his path polygons with lines. Right. And so the transformer that is used is just the famous center line replacer. Now this is an older version than what you have now. Mm -hmm. So what, what would the new one have? Uh, the, the new one, uh, there's a new mode called approximate center line. Okay. Yeah. And, and how is it better? Uh, it's a lot faster and more stable. Um, but it's not a true property, the polygons. There's yes. a trade-off. Yes. And so if we go back and look at these um, various outputs, so the new mode is this approximate one. There's what it gets us. Ah, so the customer, first of all, might be wise to dissolve stuff ahead yeah. of coming in here. That would be the first thing, maybe a dissolver followed by this thing. But yeah, you get to see all these different things. So how is that different from these other guys? Well, the meat... The medial axis mode and the straight skeleton mode, uh, both will produce a lot of kind of branches um, or dangles. And if yes. that is undesirable, the approximate center line won't do that. Right, right. So that's why it gets a bit better. So yeah, it, it looks like if we um, go back here, if I would do a dissolve ahead of this, that might, that would help. Yeah. Okay. And so if people want to try that new mode, they could, I don't know if FME 2019, it's not an FME 2018. It's not. Okay, so you'll have to you know, wait for Santa <laughs> to deliver an FME 2019 beta, probably sometime in the next month or two, and, uh, and it'll be there. And how much faster is it, Olivia? I can't give exact numbers because it really depends on the polygon, but it's yeah. thousands, hundreds of thousands <laughs> times faster, yeah. yeah. Okay. So it's, we're talking <laughs> substantially yeah. faster. So. Um, because this, because these other mathematically exact ones are a lot of work yeah. to do. All right, thanks, Olivia. Special guest appearance by Olivia. She's going to join us in World Tour next year. That's what the claim is. So you can look forward to seeing her there. Okay. And um, boy, what are we, what are we left with? Oh, just a few more, I think. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, we're down to just two. This is a fascinating one that I'm going to get. I'm going to cry a little bit of uncle on. Oh, yeah. Sometimes you have to admit defeat. <laughs> well, uh, the customer actually wrote in and said, this was hard to do. I figured it out. Is there a better way? Ah. And I looked at it and I spent a bit of mental energy thinking, is there really a better way? And um, there's a different way, but I'm unable to say if it's better or worse. Mm. Um, but the issue here is if, if you see their, their scenario, the A and the B, um, eight different polygon data sets in group A, five different polygon data sets in group B. You want to do the mother of all overlays. But the overlay, uh, area on area overlay in FME only has one input port. So that yes. means they're all going to get merged together and we're going to get little, lots and lots of little resultant polygons, even if, even between people in group B that might not intersect with group A at all. Yeah, so we might not want that. Yeah. We don't really want yeah. that. All we want is where something in group B met up with somebody in group A. We're interested in that. And so um, the key here is to use lists to sort stuff out. And so uh, I'll just look briefly at the problem. It, it, it also is a bit slow to run because there's a lot of overlays going on. Um, but uh, my my approach to it, and I might bring in Mark to... Uh, to give his, what was this one called again? I list, think, limbo. Oh, list Limbo. Oh yeah, number was, 14. Yeah. 
uh, next to symbology sorrow. Oh. And actually, uh, Olivia had to fix a bug she found. This data has weird um, circles that are arc by three point circles, and we had troubles with our point and polygon for that. Huh. So thanks, Olivia, for fixing that bug. She was busy this week. Um, here we go. No. So again, I'm doing dynamic stuff because a group A is all the meshes, group B is all the polygons. And, I, and what I thought might be interesting, and I don't have the customer's original um, example in here. Oh no, this is their original example. What they did was the overlay, and then they started to count or sift through the lists to ah. find things that they like. And based on finding things that they like, then they merged stuff together, blew it apart, and ultimately, um, I think they'd have to be a dissolve. Well, they didn't dissolve, but you might want to be able, oh yeah, there's a dissolve, right, to yeah. kind of glue things back together. Um, and so that that is reasonable. But now, I'm kind of going to be sad here because where's my, oh yeah, overlapping overlay. Sorry, I didn't see it. This was my attempt at the similar thing, and I I thought to myself, there's a few observations I made. And so let's look at these meshes for one thing. One thing that kind of hurts overlay and dissolve performance is a bunch of unnecessary polygons. Yeah. And so these meshes came from, I don't know where, but you're going to see um, that these things are all Ooh. little, they're meshes. They're all these kind of people. Ooh. And so um, if we look here at, say, the M100s, oh, that's not so good. Let's go with the this. These are all the same, they have the same attributes. So really we could reduce our problem if we merge these ahead of time, is what I was thinking. And so actually, I'm gonna go into caching mode here. If I look at this example, if I just say run to this one, and this isn't a, if you haven't used FME 2018, that's a great thing. I'm only running a little leg of this where I'm doing a, a small part. I'm gonna do only the dissolve um, here. And this dissolve, I'm grouping by the um, the attribute that kind of separates those different it's basically how bad of a flood is it mm. is what this is and um, so here comes the uh, overlay and so we get way fewer what we're going to see here is that we put 19,000 polygons in and very shortly if I'm the least bit lucky how are we doing on our dissolve we see oh, it's it's crunching away yeah yeah the remnants are actually all the little lines in between polygons that we don't need. Oh, it's done. And so uh, we took 19,000 inputs and we end up with 3,000 outputs approximately. So wow. that would be one thing to make the problem run faster is to dissolve the things that don't need to be separate. And then, and then what I was really thinking after that is um, these things will actually overlap each other. So there's several groups in here that that kind of overlap and so oh I, I know what i can do if i just run only this transformer let's try this so if i just blow and this is uh, an inspector that is grouping by rp so here i can see the different um layers if i zoom in here you can start to see okay so here's this whole mess if i look at the 100 year or the 200 year polygon okay it's all joined together the 100 year this one you start to see how they kind of are, they're on top of each other. And so now what I could do to reduce the problem set is, okay, let's overlay only the flood ones on top of each other to get a coverage of floods, saving in them a list here of, of what year or how severe the flood was for each little resultant. And then I can overlay the, the uh, land area ones on them. I get two coverages. Now I've got two coverages, each of which know who they came from to begin with. I could overlay them on top of each other. And then here I can throw away anything that um, was not in the input just once. Uh -huh. And that way I have stuff that's interesting. And then I would explode out the list and start dissolving. But I'm not convinced that that's any better than what the customer did. Hmm. So that's um, hopefully there's something in there for people to think about. But that's the, li the list one. I think we're nearly out of time. We'll see if Trent wants to come in here and talk about CAD conversion. The, the last one we were going to look at was uh, looking at CAD. And the idea that this person had was, look, I've got a bunch of DGN files. And I don't care uh, 
about how these things are laid out, where they came from. I just want one workspace. They thought that FME should ship with this workspace, so maybe we will do this after your fine work, Trent. Do you feel good about that? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Trent has been working uh, here at SAFE for quite some time, specializing in the Esri side of the universe with utilities network stuff. Yes. So if you want free utilities consulting, here's your chance, people. Um, yes. Okay, good. And so what Trent has did was set up, again, a dynamic read from MicroStation. And then, first of all, what you're doing here is setting up a special attribute that must be special for our Esri friends. Yes. Yeah, so this uh, will, for in the DGN, there, um, there's different levels. So this um, was making the assumption that if you would want uh, your uh, different levels in a different feature data set inside the geo database. Uh, so this just sets, um, basically, it'll just create the feature data set based on the level name yes. that's inside the DGN. Right. And so now, the next thing you do is, because in CAD, all the geometries kind of mix together in one happy family, in the Esri land, we need them segregated out into their own little houses. And so what you're doing here is, is um, splitting out the input based on the geometry type. That's correct, yes. Uh, so we route the points, uh, the lines, and the areas to their respective feature class that we've just named point, line, or area with the, uh, with the obvious, the correct geometry. Yes. Uh, and we're also filtering, because um, the user wanted their annotation, so we filter on the text geometry, and that will uh, go to the annotation feature class. And that is not feature linked. That's just a separate yeah. annotation uh, feature class. Right. And then because you set up this um, feature data set ahead of time, you're going to see something, like if there was one layer, sorry, level named, um, named Dale, inside Dale, if there were points and polygons, we'll see a point and a poly polygon. Uh, Kind of thing in, inside, in, in, yeah, inside the, the Dale database. feature data set, yes. Yeah, so that, that way, that's having the best of both worlds. You're still split by the original uh, level names, but you also can keep the geometries apart from each other, too. Correct. Awesome. Any other tricks with this thing? Uh, one thing um, with Dale mentioned that it's, um, it's dynamic reading. So if you were to, uh, this is set up with a user parameter, so basically it will just uh, ask you to, you know, um, specify the folder directory that all your DGNs are located in, and it will read all the DGNs that are located within that right. folder. So here it is, star.dgn, and it would just read them all and out they go. Correct. Oh, and is the data set, is the output data set fanning out by? Yes, it fans out by, uh, based on the go. DGN name. Right, so that was the other thing. They wanted it always a, a different file geodatabase for every DGN. Correct. And we're accomplishing that with data set fan out. Yes. And so again, more of this dynamic stuff. At least half of these oh. problems involved dynamic stuff. Everybody's got to read Brian and team's tutorial on dynamic things. Correct, yes, it's very helpful. And there was also this business of uh, projection files, but actually FME will pick those up automatically. If Correct, they're there. by default, the setting is toggled on. So if, there exists, if they exist in the same directory as the DGN, they will be applied automatically. Right, so um, if you use Esri tools, they'll often dot, drop a dot WLD and a .prj, which takes the CAD and tags it up so that GIS world is happy and safe and Ezra get along real well. And so we just will honor those things that have been laid down there. Exactly. If they're not there, hey, your day is going to end up where yes. it ends up. <laughs> all right. I think that that's it. Thanks, Trent. And he's heading back there to answer all those utility networks questions that I'm sure are pouring in. And Trent, you're going to come to the Ezra UC, aren't you? Yes. So he'll be there all three days. It's kind of like a stand-up comedian. You can come by and exactly. check him out. Yeah. Free services. Okay. I think Iris will call this uh, it. Yeah, we're out of time. But that was a lot of uh, great demos in there. Oh, yeah. Here are the links. Just last two links. There's a video on both data processing, Mark Ireland. Uh, Mark hinted at some of the techniques from that about using um, workspace runners and things to get stuff done in a hurry. The Las Vegas one was a good example. Yeah. And then the dynamic workflow that I've been harping about, there's a nice link to that one. Yeah. So Stephanie had it there for us. Yeah. All right, people, uh, thank you so much. Uh, we, didn't, we, we didn't talk about what we couldn't do. One person, well, kind of in the, the list limbo, I kind of admitted defeat. One person wanted to uh, have us read symbology out of an MXD. And FME can't do that, so we're sorry. Um, MXDs are um, kind of no-fly zones for us for the most part because we, we can't interpret and read the symbology stuff that's that's in there. And so, sorry about that. We can fish color out of layer files, I think, dot .lyr yeah, files. Okay. But that's about as good as it gets. And um, I think with that, we'll hang around a bit longer and talk about some questions and answers, but if you got to run on your end, 
Thanks so much for tuning in. This is uh, not quite goodbye, but sort of adios for now until we get to the after party in a few seconds. Okay. <laughs> yep. yep, yep. <laughs> from, from me, Dale. And me, Iris. And Mark, are you going to hang around for the after party? Absolutely. You bet. Okay. If you have to run, take off. But now starts the after party. Um, Mark, what kind of questions were pouring in and what uh, what's your assessment of of uh, the audience's mood? Um, I, I, my assessment is they, they seem pretty happy. We had some interesting questions for sure. Um, one of them was uh, whether using the feature writer to write out raster, could you parallelize that? And would that uh, make things a little bit faster? Which uh, I, I said it probably would, but um, that's... Yes, you could start you could use you could actually put the feature writer into a into, into a custom, custom transformer which could be made yes. to run in parallel for example yes. but um that in general the rasters are well behaved when it comes to writers because they let me think about that no i'm wrong the feature writer would force every um raster to be output right away whereas the other ones yes. they might actually pile up in memory that's what I was thinking, yeah. So if there was any yeah. part of that workspace to parallelize, it would be the writer, not the uh, transformers. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, someone was asking about uh, Excel and the Excel Styler transformer, which uh, is a very useful one and got some uh, very good updates in 2018. So that's, uh, well, actually, I think it was brand new for 2018. So. You know, I, it's sort of sad. I don't think we touched on Excel once during this. We didn't this. have an Excel. We had PDF, but no Excel. We had PDF. <laughs> we had right. CSV. Yeah. But anyway, sorry, Mr. Excel. He's number. He's battling it out for the number two position yeah. in terms of the most popular format in FME. He was, or she, I, I should better be careful. They, they were in number two position briefly until AutoCAD stormed back and uh, nudged it out to be, uh, to take over number two. So it's a battle Battle for number two. Number one, of course. Shapefile, I'm you guessing. Betcha. Yep, I'm always on top there. <laughs> and and the PDF format we're writing, that is Adobe Geospatial PDF. That's right. Yes, that it, would be the Geospatial. It's yeah. not Geo PDF, which I That's believe. correct. There is the uh, the Terago, Terago version, one, yes. and then we don't write that. We write the, um, the one that uh, basically is part of the Adobe standard. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was a question, so I just wanted to check on that. Um, with the um, the other, one of the final ones you were doing now, I can't remember what, which uh, demo it was. Um, it was one with the area on area overlayer. Yes. And, um, and I tried doing that by um, creating multiple copies with the cloner of, of the group B data and ah. giving, giving the same ID number to that as to each of the different groups in group A and then using the uh, group by on the area on area overlayer. Yes. Which I, which I think sort of avoided the need for lists, but obviously you're multiplying the data X number of times, but it uh, that was certainly an interesting problem uh, for sure. Yes. yes, actually, Mark, I think that the idea of cloning it, if you combine your cloning idea um, with the uh, with dissolving those little triangles ahead of time. Yeah. I mean, one of the things you want to try to do is have as little stuff resulting as possible. So there's, there's the more little things you get, the more work it is for poor mm -hmm. FME. So yeah. I, I like your idea because you'd end up, um, I think with, with fewer small polygons, you'd get more big ones that are in different groups that are, are faster to handle, I have a feeling. Yes. Uh, there was another question about the, um, again, I'll try to remember which, uh, the dynamic duo uh, scenario, and would oh. it work on non-spatial data, which it would, yep. um, and also could FME server be involved to check for the database to see if they've been updates in the database? Um, my answer to that was, if it was a database, probably a trigger to trigger FME servers better rather than FME server uh, looking for changes in the database. Uh, I don't know if you agree certainly with seen that. people do that where they they um, create a trigger that let's let's imagine that there's a new view that's been added. I don't know enough about database stuff, but I'm guessing you could tie in and say whenever there's a new view, 
do something, and that something could be firing a workspace to run. Yes, yes, that's right. Um, but if it was a file based instead of a database, then yeah, FME server could use uh, notifications to uh, to get to, to trigger itself, basically. Yeah, and in the worst case, you set up a schedule and it runs every night, and um, you <clears throat> you you keep yeah. track of what the last state was, and then sniff the input to see if that seems different and if it is different then you do something yeah yes. i believe that or you could potentially use the directory watcher there to detect changes yeah. there yeah. yes and the a little bit of a spoiler when when iris isn't working on this uh on this webinar she's busy making it very easy for people to set up that kind of fme server stuff we're talking about for FME 2019, we're gonna have to. That's gonna be super exciting. Yes, yeah, so we've got a lot coming to make that those notification features easier for you yeah. um, within the server interface. So that yeah. would be something to stay tuned for for yeah. 2019 yeah. for sure. Yeah. There was another question just came in. Can FME create multiple page table PDF like a report of addresses within a city? And I think you mentioned uh, um, you can set the page number. But so page multiple pages is possible. That PDF page number is a great trick. Tables, we do not, I believe, have native table builder. But uh, back in my uh, experts days, I did build a custom transformer called the table adder. Um, and the idea was this was exactly for this kind of scenario. So um, it's, it's not as robust as maybe one of our built in transformers, but you can give that custom transformer. It's available on FME Hub. Uh, if you that a try it should allow you to set up a, a very basic table based on a sub, some attributes values um, you have to do a little bit of work to make to make things look nice a little bit of tweaking with that one um, but it should be possible to get a table and a PDF using that table adder and there may well be I believe there was at one point an example of that somewhere on the the knowledge center there may be one out there um, if not we can look at spinning something up using that using that um, I know back in the day, I think I had a world tour example using it a long time ago. So I'll maybe dig that up and we can we could share that out. I'm kind of making myself a problem here, but um, I don't know what I'm doing. But another thing that comes to mind, and I've not, I'm just making this up on the fly here. We have the new Microsoft Word. So if I do M Microsoft Word, no M S Word Styler, I'm just reading. Let's see what I got here. Street names. Oof, I don't know what. I'm a little bit nervous. I better check what I've got. So let's just run only that. And another thing that reminds me, HTML also has a native built-in uh, table builder. So again, if you use that HTML report, um, I know we have the ability to make a nice table with that. Um, and again, yeah, Word. But I, it should be possible in PDF. Um, if you need a PDF, I think uh, that should be possible. The other thing with Word is within Word, I believe you can easily convert to a PDF. Um, yes. So within, that's what I'm, yes. I'm going to yeah. make like the lamest ever table. Um, whoa, okay, I'm going to stick with the table grid. Okay, let's try that. And um, let's see, I do MS Word Writer, Microsoft Word Writer. I've actually never done this. So let's go to Ooh. slash temp slash danger dot doc x. <laughs> okay, I'll go to manual. I'm going to manual mode. Okay, let's do that. And um, in theory, this is going to write me a multi-page table with 400 and some things in it. A little bit slow to crank all these entries. And then, and as you could script something that would convert, I've seen customers you do this. Script that, yeah. That or, converts that yeah. to PDF. Now the thing is, I'd have, probably have to fiddle with this table definition because I don't know if my heading is going to be automatically on every new page. Mm. So I might have picked a smaller one to try instead of <laughs> <laughs> quite a few features here. 500 street names that I don't know where that I have no idea where this data came from. It just was it's in my directory of 25 years of data. And isn't this exciting as we enter the 450? 400. <laughs> but in theory this should be possible. I think this scenario um there will it may be not the the easiest thing to do, but it should be possible to do this with an FME to create a multi-page yeah. uh, PDF I, of tables. Right. Yeah. I don't think our PDF writer today is tuned up for that. And that using PDF for reporting in general, it's really our PDF writing today is more about kind of fancy maps like the stuff that, yeah. that Iris showed. Okay, so we've got a docx file, danger. 40 kilobytes seems kind of small. 
see. Yeah, there we go. Oh, it looks like now, a table. <laughs> I don't I don't know that the heading is going to repeat. He nervously scrolls. No, it doesn't. So somehow there would be a way to um, get this heading to repeat of uh, this 11 page PDF. But anyway, they're not PDF Word doc, but there's there's a table. There's a start of a table that one might be able to fiddle with and make make work nicer. And if not, then we would uh, request an enhancement to this um, the table writer so that we can repeat the um, the names on each mm -hmm. page. So anyway, that's that one. Anything else, Mark? Absolutely. Um, so there was a question just come in about reading and writing real time GPS tracking data, which I think is very similar to that scenario that we posted to the Knowledge Center, which was actually uh, real time bicycle tracking in uh, the city of London. Um, so we, in that example, that was uh, an XML feed. Um, I, I gave it a try. Nobody uh, responded on the Knowledge Center, but I gave that a try with the XML, uh, no, sorry, the text reader, read the text, read the XML as a, a text file. Oh, and yeah. Then, uh, and then use the uh, XML, um, What's the transformer? XML fragmenter, that was it. And the fragmenter okay. can take what we've read with the text line data and split it up into its components. And I guess it would depend on what format the, the GPS tracking data was in, but um, you could certainly um, uh, do a similar thing with that if it was an XML stream. So Mark, the, the bicycle, oh, I see, yes, 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 got it. Okay. The one on the knowledge base that we posted, there should be a yes. link to that stream. Yes. I know which one it is. It's not here. I'll get there. I'll get there by going to Q&A and you're yeah. probably on the second page by now. No, because somebody uh, posted a, so we're halfway up the page. This one? Yes. Uh, the person who submitted the video um, issue posted it. In front, okay. So, uh, yeah, yeah. So we, we can look at that. But the uh, the, scenario, yeah. the other scenario was the bicycle feed, which was the one above that. Um, right. Okay. Yeah. 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 Scenario one. Yeah. Yeah. So I know that Dimitri Dimitri has been playing with an app that's for Android that basically you you just it's an app that's out there and you just add a a URL that it should call any time that there's movement or the, some sort of thing, and you just get this thing running on Android, and it's just calling FME server with an update. And so with this, Dimitri can track his every mo movement ah. very easily. Fantastic. Yeah, generally, so, uh, no, go on. Go on, Iris. Sorry, Mark. Uh, I was just going to say, usually if you're talking real time, there would be a chance you'd be thinking about FME server-based yes. solutions yes. Uh, to make sure you have something that's essentially always running. Uh, so it kind of goes beyond your workspace, and, and you uh, Move your workspace to FME server. Yes, that's exactly what I was going to say. So uh, great minds thinking alike there. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Any any other questions we should uh, look at, Mark? Are they still pouring in, or the um, are the folks getting ready to go to coffee? Probably just one more question to uh, to look at. Um, it says your last example was great, but if one was wanting to use a buffered version of each file, uh, then clipping to the original boundaries just to eliminate these edge of tile issues. Could you use a similar process? So in other oh. words, you, I, I So which guess example is that, do you think, Mark? The uh, the Las, Las Vegas one. Oh, OK, yes. So we, we were working on each individual tile. Yes. I guess the idea is, well, if you buffered that to grab a bit of the surrounding tile, just so you didn't have any odd edge cases. Yes. Then did the work, then clipped it back again. Right, because what I actually what I failed to show people was that I was grouping by base name here. Yeah. So. So yes, it, okay. I was thinking about that actually, and I knew I was cheating a little bit, and I wondered if anybody would catch me on that, and I've been busted. Mm, <laughs> Rats, and it was so close to getting out too. Oh. Um, I would have gotten away Very with it end. too if it wasn't for those pesky kids. Uh, but. Uh, what you do then, okay, so there's a few things to consider here. Boy, it, it, 
it, the, the truest best way would be to turn off this group by. So if I don't group by anything, now I'm going to get one nice big model for the whole place. Oh, sorry, Hillshader doesn't. Hillshader works. Actually, Hillshader we don't really have as much edge effect worries, but it it really doesn't um, doesn't have a, a group by on it. So mm -hmm. it's going to do one at a time. But this guy here um, will. So let me just think. If we really wanted to, let's see, we generate the whole thing, which now now it's going to be a large data volume. So it'll be slower. So we're going to yes. sacrifice some performance. Yes. Yeah. Um, what I would want to do now is get a bounding box replacer. I'm making this up as I go. Um, let's see, for this person, so that, and then what I would do, I don't need to mosaic here anymore. Um, and then what I would do is I would put in a clipper because, and that's the bounding box is my clipper. And I would take this, this guy here and put him there and the part that's inside I'd put here. Do you think, do you believe in that, Iris? Yep, that seems reasonable. And this, this upsets yeah. me, so then I would just say move down. Ooh, okay. Um, and I think I'm, all I'm, would be well. I'm wondering about the bounding box replacer. Should that be the raster extents coercer? That could also work. I that's wonder what Yes, I wasn't sure if because um, <clears throat> that. Oh, does, the bounding box works with raster. That's a good. Well, no, I question. know the bounding the it bounding box does. That. Okay. The oh, real interesting does. question is, do these things produce different outputs? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't know. Um, and so uh, we're in we're in fancy caching mode. Let's just uh, let's just find out. I forget how many inputs I've got here. Okay, so there's, I got 12 there. I'm gonna just run this one only two. Boom, and so now I can highlight two of these, right click and say inspect, thank you, Ian. And uh, notice how I'm cheating like crazy. I haven't run the whole workspace. And so here these two things are, and do they, ooh, they don't quite. Ah, oh, that's interesting, okay. Oh. So the bounding box, okay, who is it that overlaps? There's Mr. Oh, the bounding boxes overlap. It looks like the other oh, they, they do overlap well. too. They look quite, I think they look the same to me. Oh, yeah, it looks like they're just the same. They are the same. Okay. Well. All right. So they overlap just a little bit. And then actually, should I, should I go for it? Let's just see if I do this. And uh, this is going to cause a giant surface model, a giant DEM, which is going to be clipped. And we should get 12 out. So isn't this partial run the cat's meow, Mark? It is. It's fantastic. Um, I, I can't, can't say enough about so, yeah, it. Yeah, you can see now it's adding, it's saying four of 12 large geometries. It's kind of telling me, hey, buddy, um, <laughs> it, it would be trickier. You could set this up so that for each One, I go only. That would be a yeah. A you have to have a some sort of. I have to think through that more carefully, like a feature reader kind of example, yeah. or somehow where um, I pump each one through as my primary. I do a secondary to read its neighbors. I make the model like that way. I don't make the entire, like all of the whole universe into one model at a time. But that I would be doing a lot more work too. So it's it's an interesting trade off. I think maybe when you had more, if you had more than 12, I think with 12, it yeah. might not be worth it, but if you exactly. had 200 or something like that, it might so, be So here's my 12 that were inside, and he nervously clicks on this to see his 12. Yep. Oh, it looks pretty and good. And that, that did work. So there, I, I got it back, and I have no, I, I don't believe I should have any edge effects in here. The coloring is funny, but that's because each one gets colored separately mm. is the problem. If I want to see that nicely, I could put down a mosaicer and see that's the beauty of this partial run. I could just say, you know what, I just want to take a peek at that and then I'll just run only that one. Here we go. There. Now it looks nice. Oh, that looks quite nice. Yeah. See, there's a river there. Yeah. 
All right, I nearly got away with it, but uh, not quite. I came back at the end. And <laughs> All right, well, 143 people still think it's worth listening to us, Mark, but should we bid them adieu? Pretty much, I think. Um, I mean, if I've got one more question to ask myself, it will be, do you have any tips of finding the right transformer when you don't really know which one it is? If you got, ah. if you say, I want to do task X, what transformer do I need? How do I find that? Have you got any tips? I'm sorry, I threw that one at you out of the blue, but... Um... Yes. Well, I mean, I would start by, let's say I was working with rasters. I would just type raster on the uh, canvas, and then I would start going up and down and uh, thinking, okay, what are these like? And, uh, so, you know, so that's one thing. I would certainly go out to um, safe.com slash transformers. And then in here, start saying. Because um, this, this will search our documentation as well. So yeah. uh, more keywords, you might get more hits uh, per keyword here. So, you know, so if I start thinking of things like that or, you know, what's, some, what's an interesting topic? Uh, let's see. Clipping. Um, yeah, clipping. I don't And I think if you're really stumped, I think we've shown how quick a response you can get on the Knowledge Center. There's, yeah. We've got a lot of really bright people uh, signed up there. Um, so if you can't, if you're, you know, if you're getting stumped looking on your own, uh, that's always a great place because uh, there's people around the world, FME users around the world, um, constantly answering questions on there. So that's always um, that's always a good place when you've got a really tricky tricky problem to get some ideas. And if you look at something like for example, the tester, if you hit the documentation, we're in the process of updating all of these, but many of these uh, have um, links to related transformers. So yeah, like in here, if you're doing this, then try the test filter. Ah, oh, okay. So the, the documentation will give you clues as to related transformers. I know that um, things like the, um, let's say the spatial, I think this has been redone recently, the spatial filter, for example. Um, if we go to the spatial filter, because the common thing is all the different joins and things. And I noticed the results there were similar transformers that you might use instead of the spatial filter. So your initial yes. search gave us, um, because of these links in the doc, you'll also get ideas. Your search for yeah. spatial filter gives you um, some other transformers that might be a little closer to what you're looking for. Right. That are related. Ah, see, there's this whole table, yeah. choosing a spatial transformer. So um, here you get onto all these ones. When when do you want to? So I know that over like long ago our transformer doc was a little bit lean. That is changing, and there's lots of uh, cross references and hints getting into there. And so that's a good place. Don't don't be afraid to actually dive into the transformer doc. What one tip I, I perhaps give with with searching for things is the tab key in Quick Add. Uh, ah. If you if you type. If you if you say type clipping because you want to do some clipping, then nothing comes up because it doesn't have the name. But if you press the tab key, then it flips into content search rather than name search. So the tab key, yes. there. That's, uh, that's and cool. actually, while we're on the, um, I think Iris, were you part of that meeting where we brainstormed the future of this? I, I know I did work on it at one point. Yes. I, um, I may not have been in the more recent meeting. It's we, been we're a while. thinking that we're actually going to tie in a like a, a high-end search engine into the right-hand side here. Uh, for for better searching. Yes, yes. we're a so little that, bit limited right now. Yeah. Right. So so for example, if we said clipping, showing you this feels like there's an opportunity for us to do something better on the right-hand side. Mm -hmm. If no direct results were found, okay, fine, we'll go out and we'll try a little bit. You know, we'll ask Alexa. Well, yeah, maybe <laughs> even go out to the cloud to yes. search. I think that was the idea. Uh, hey Alexa, yeah. everybody's computers are now. Uh, everybody's. Hey Alexa, order me uh, whatever. So I better be careful. I'm uh, getting uh -oh. people's offices uh, like Amazon is firing up, but um, that kind of thing could be done. Yeah. Okay. I don't, think any, don't think there's any more questions. So um, we're probably all probably right. So this is where, kind of like Ferris Bueller at the end of the movie. We can say, okay, people, it's over. You can go now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Shane. All right. Anyway, thanks, everybody, for, for sticking it out. Thanks, Mark, for your insights and uh, for your late night helping us uh, last night. You're welcome. 
And Iris, always a pleasure working for yeah. you. We'll have to do this again, maybe when we can show off some of the cool work you're doing with your team these days on server sometime in the fall or spring next year. Yeah, looking forward to it. It would be great to do another one of these. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Until next time.